Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest once again is an old friend, James McGregor Burns, Woodrow Wilson Professor of Government Emeritus at Williams College and Senior Scholar at the Jepson School of Leadership Studies. Now, last time we discussed his and historian Susan Dunn's new Atlantic Monthly Press study of the three Roosevelts, Theodore Franklin and Eleanor, who they identify as patrician leaders who transformed America. Of course, all of Jim Byrne's major books have been provocative ventures in Americana. The Lion and the Fox was the first volume of his magnificent biography of FDR. Its sequel, Roosevelt, the Soldier of Freedom, won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Other Byrne studies range from John Kennedy, a political profile, to the monumental trilogy he called The American Experiment making my guest the quintessential American historian and political scientist. But now I want to use the rest of this blessed time together, our first in this new century, to parse what other insights into the American experience James McGregor Burns would, sh would share with us and those who come after. And Jim, I wanted first to needle you a little bit because over the past years, and we did our first program together, God Help Us Both, in 1956, um, we've talked about third parties and uh, somehow or other the introduction of uh, what I would call disparate elements to the American political scene. And I wonder here in um, this year following the election of 2000, uh, how you feel about uh, third parties or efforts to intrude into the two-party system and the result. Uh, well, what you call needling, Dick, is one reason that I always love to come back and be with you because we get into a little debate, not just a love fest. And um, I have very strong feelings, as you might suspect, about third parties. I say to people in third parties, Join one of the major parties and make it better. Take Ralph Nader. I think no, you take Ralph Nader. <laughs> I don't want him. <laughs> well, I'll take Ralph Nader. Had a long talk with him on the phone about this one time, about third parties, and inviting him, if I had the right to do so, to get into the Democratic Party, to fight in the Democratic Party primaries, to try to make the Democratic Party a more liberal, a more purposeful, a more honest party. Instead of sitting out there, separating himself and helping produce the horrible December that we went through uh, last year. So they say to me, of course, uh, well, these parties are too compromising, flabby, and so on. And I say, that's right. Come in and make them better. Are you convinced that by making them better, and by that I believe you mean taking extremely different stands on issue? Not extremely different, but significantly different okay, stands. Okay, let, let, let me ask about that. <clears throat> what about the definition, the difference between extremely and significantly? What do you think this country would tolerate, could stand? Well, I think uh, an extreme position of the Democratic for the Democratic Party would be to become, in effect or by name, the Socialist Party of the country. 
Whereas when I talk about being significantly different, it would mean uh, much stronger positions than Clinton took. And uh, if I were a Republican, I would probably feel that Bush should take much stronger conservative positions than he's presently taking. The point is, Dick, to get a choice before the American people. That's what this comes down to, in my view. Why are we getting this decline in voting turnout? A number of reasons. To me, the most significant reason is people say to me, and I'm sure to you, why go? There's no difference between the candidates. There's no difference between the parties. So if only in terms of invigorating our democracy, I think there should be two parties. And I can illustrate it not, fi not as wide as this or as close as this, but simply giving this choice to the American people. On specific issues, how would you identify where they would stand? Social security, uh, uh, minimum wage laws, um, tax levels. Well, on taxes, I think it's uh, outrageous that we had a tax reduction that so much benefited the rich. I'm, the, I'm not the first one to say that, but it just stares me in the face at this point in time. Uh, on the minimum wage, and I'm close to a lot of people on the minimum wage, it's absurdly low. You cannot live on the minimum wage. Uh, take health. Now here's an interesting example that probably is good for your case, better for your case than for me, and that is the health bill uh, of Clinton's, where that was a case of, of, of the Democratic Party going significantly to my left here. But the thing that struck me about that, Dick, was the aftermath. It got badly treated. They did not do a good job in bringing it out. We know that back in 1994, 93, 94. But the thing that bothered me was that once they got that initial defeat, the way Clinton pulled away from that, I don't think Hillary did, but Clinton seemed almost embarrassed that he had presented this bill to the uh, uh, Congress. And to me, much of the greatness of leadership lies in persistence, which means conviction. You believe in something so much, you uh, stick with it. And the history of reform in this country, Dick, has been the history of persistence. Take one example, women's fight for the right to vote. Imagine all the decades that they failed the way that health bill failed. They could not get the vote, all sorts of problems. They stuck to it. It took much too long. But in, in 100 years, women got the right to vote through sheer persistence and a lot of militants. So I think great changes take place that are needed by one party, whether it's the conservative party under Reagan or a liberal party under an FDR type or a Republican party under a TR type who really believe in what they're doing, stick to it, fight for it, take their defeats, come back into the battle, and hopefully finally win out. But in an effort to win, the media are used and public relations devices, let me not just use the term the media, but public relations devices, spin control, all of that is used to obfuscate differences at the very time that you're talking about uh, emphasizing differences. Give us a choice. Uh, every campaign is designed, it seems to me, certainly in the last generation, to obfuscate where obfuscation seems likely to get more votes here or more votes there. Well, by obfuscate, do you mean that they play up the differences more no. than they should? No, I mean just the, the opposite, that there can be a determination. You and I can identify one party with one stand on uh, uh, health matters. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you get to the election period, there is such an effort to pretend that all people are all things well, in all positions. Yes, and uh, there's a tremendous emphasis on that magic word consensus. So how or are we going another to... one, bipartisanship. 
And I think these are terrible words in a democracy because the essence of democracy is conflict. It's disagreeing. It's presenting different points of view. And I think you're right. The media doesn't seem to understand that. They do play up a lot of sort of trivial conflict from day to day, of course, because it makes news. But when it comes to examining the leadership of the country, anytime somebody um, is, is particularly uh, bipartisan, uh, negotiating with the other party, sitting around the table and making agreements, they play this up as wonderful leadership. I don't want people sitting around the table making deals. I want two parties to go to the people with different programs and to give the people a choice. You know, it seems to me that when you ticked off, and I was very happy to hear you tick off issues, it seems to me that one could easily say, but Jim Burns, on those issues, we know that the Democrats by and large stand here and the Republicans by and large stand there. Don't we have that already? I don't think sufficiently. I don't think Clinton made it that clear as to the differences uh, between him and the Republican opposition. There was a great deal of uh, uh, negotiation during that period, but there's one other element, Dick, we should bring in here, and we've talked about this. We have a system that makes it very hard for there to be two strong parties because uh, let's take the, uh, the, the uh, now Republican uh, House and the, uh, and the Democratic Senate that it turned out to be. The now Democratic That's Senate. Right. You've got to be fair. That's right. Uh, and uh, the cases we've had of presidents and Congress and sometimes the two houses of Congress being of different parties. So that puts an enormous burden on the president to be a negotiator to begin with, and I recognize that. The question I raise is, when do you rise above negotiation? And usually that happens in an election, which sort of clarifies where people stand and where the politicians stand. When the election fails to do that, which I think happened a lot last year, then you've got the combination of the checks and balances, this awkward, old-fashioned political system we have on the one end, and you've got fudging in the election on the other. So you end up with a pretty lousy situation politically. Jim, let me ask, uh, we've talked together all these years, as you look back, what changes would you make in the fundamental, well, let's call it the instrument of government or instruments of government? What would you do differently? Well, you've got me in kind of a corner here, Dick, because I happen to be one of those who feel that the framers knew what they were doing. The most brilliant feat of what I call transformational leadership in the history of the West by collectively, again, working up this constitution, which I think was very appropriate for, let's say, the 19th century, but is not appropriate for this century. What would I change in this masterwork of the mm -hmm. framers? I would do away with a two-year term for congressman, for representative. I ran for Congress once, and I knew that if I won, as soon as I won, I'd spend most of my time simply raising money for the next race. Uh, I would shorten the Senate terms from six years to four. I would have president, congressmen, and senators all running at the same time so we could elect a Republican government or a Democratic government and get stronger leadership in Washington. Now, if that probably doesn't curl your hair enough, uh, I could probably offer some other radical ideas. Should we call it parliamentary government? Not really, because parliamentary government uh, does not have the presidency that we have. Mm -hmm. And the presidency that we have, with all its dangers, is the great strengthening force. I think we could get a combination of parliamentary government and presidential government the way that de Gaulle did to some extent in France. You think it could happen? No, you really don't. You no. don't think we're going to do that? No, I think we consider the Constitution to be sacred. I think the Bill of Rights is sacred, but I don't think the Constitution itself is sacred because it's just a structure of government. 
and I think it should be modernized. But do I think it will happen? Too much constitution worship in this country. As an alternative, then, what your what back off position do you have? I think we'll continue to turn to the presidency during crisis and put a greater and greater burden on the White House. And I'm worried that sometime in this century, Dick, there will be a constitutional crisis that will lead to a kind of presidential dictatorship such as we've never really known. I mean, we've had quasi-presidential dictatorship actually under Abraham Lincoln. But uh, to put it more simply, I think that with an old-fashioned constitution and with what's likely to happen in the 21st century, we'll have a constitutional crisis. And I'm just worried that we might do very bad things at that point. One reason I work on this whole question of constitutional reform, like the little changes I suggested, is to have something in place in case that should ever happen. Why do you feel that this will happen in the 21st century? What are the elements that will bring about this situation? I think it's going to happen because of the fundamental thing that's happening in this country, in my view, and perhaps in the whole world. It is the contrast between the enormous changes that are taking place in this country, let's say, in industry, in finance, in the media, in science, in technology, in medicine, many other areas. Tremendous changes on the one hand, and a feeble, incrementalist government trying to catch up with, to do something about, to cope with these changes. And at a certain point, I think, in this century, as these non-governmental changes take place, the government will still be this ponderous old machine that we watch. Uh, there will be such a gap between change on the one hand and lack of change in government that there will be a crisis. Because, Dick, the only thing you and I and the rest of the people control to some extent is the government. We can't control these great corporations, the media, nor do we really wish to. And uh, so my, qu my guess is that at a certain point, that gap between the two will be so obvious that we'll have a constitutional crisis. Have we come close to that kind of constitutional crisis? I Steel think, strike, something like that? Well, that's a little example. You, you, you a, you're, a, you're a good historian to think of that. That's a good example of uh, what could happen on a small scale. I'm thinking of things happening on a large scale. And to answer your question, I say to my students, in my lifetime, and I can say in your lifetime, uh, this will not happen. I think it will happen in their lifetime. What will change, though, just in a, a, a continuing expansion of the powers of the private sector? Well, I, I think if things become, if the private sector becomes so irresponsible that there is a huge reaction against it, as occurred actually during both TR's time and uh, under FDR, that um, there might actually be the possibility of fundamental changes that would modernize government, strengthen government to cope with what's going on in the private sector. But I, I would say the chances of that are about two out of five. Where do you see in the present, and we just have a few minutes left, where do you see in the present political scene, on the present political scene, signs of uh, lions <laughs> prowling around? I don't really see them. I, I look at some of these congressional leaders, like Adasio, hoping that uh, that's a possibility there. I will say to you, uh, as someone who's talked with Hillary uh, Clinton and uh, walked here across the border from Massachusetts, we get a lot of New York State news and follow that campaign uh, closely, I think there is a potential president of the United States, which would be, of course, the first, presumably the first woman president, unless Elizabeth Dole on the Republican side, I'll be bipartisan here, uh, takes the lead. but. Uh, it may be that this 
lack of great male potential leaders makes us look more at the women in this country. You know, it's interesting. On that score, on others too, I realize that you and I have experienced today in the two programs that we've done a lot of discussion about change, about leadership. We haven't said anything, and it reminds me of the criticism of FDR in his first inaugural address. We haven't said anything about the world outside. Well, I did make the point that uh, FDR faced up to his to the great menace of Hitlerism and so on. Right. That was a brief comment. That was later on. Well, in the foreign policy area, you, you do have to have strong executive leadership, and typically we do provide that to the president. The president has really got quite a lot of treaty-making power and executive uh, foreign policy-making power that uh, makes it, I think, less of a critical situation. I, I, d I don't understand that, really, Jim, because it seems to me that things are going on outside of our borders, beyond our borders, that put us in so many, make us vulnerable in so many areas. I agree, outside our borders, but in terms of our response to what's going on, it seems to me that the president's foreign policy making and commander in chief powers gives the government more strength than we have in the domestic arena. I see. You say we have the, we have the capacity. Yes. Do you feel that that capacity has been uh, tapped, used? No. Uh, on the whole, I think uh, that's one of the great failings uh, in the post-war period, that we have not had the strong visionary leadership. Uh, T.R. actually uh, won the Nobel Prize. People forget this for his leadership in foreign policy. FDR, we know Ironically, about. the Peace Prize. Yes, that's right. Good point. The Peace Prize. Uh, and uh, we know about FDR. We know about Eleanor and uh, uh, the magnificent Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, we, don't, we don't have that today. Well, you say we don't have that today. You're not saying we don't have the opportunities for the exercise of that kind of leadership. I think we have opportunities. Uh, more optimistically, as I see students, I feel that we're developing a student interest in international affairs that really will pay off in the coming decades. Well, I, I'm so interested in, the, in your most recent book, The Three Roosevelts. You're talking about three internationalists, three leaders in the outside world. My sense as I uh, talk to my students, different from yours, different sense, I I don't have the sense of people who are basically interested in the outside world. I don't have the sense of people who fundamentally are as interested as our generation was in the crises of the times, maybe because there aren't such crises. Um, but don't you have, oh, that's a stupid way for me to put it. Why, why, why put it that way? It seems to me that there is a growing isolationism, and I gather you don't quite feel well, that. Well, I may be influenced by the fact that Susan Dunn and I had lunch yesterday with a student who definitely plans to be Secretary of State uh, great. in a few decades. I mean, we think that's great, too. And he's, he's willing to admit it. That's just one example. But I just have to say that the students I run into make me more optimistic than evidently in your case. Their interest in the world outside. Absolutely. That's, that's quite fascinating. And they're out there. They're traveling. and they're, they're doing these foreign programs. They're spending years abroad. They've always done this, but there's much more of this today. Junior year abroad is a big thing, for example. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the voting public of this great republic of ours, what do you think about it now in terms of the world outside? I think it's pretty well oriented to it. And I must say, here I give the media a lot of uh, praise. I think the media does play up, uh, at least maybe I read the media that does it, that the media does emphasize foreign policy much more than when I was a student. That's interesting. When Walter Isaacson, when he was editor-in-chief of Time itself, Time magazine itself, was here, I took out a, a, a group of, um, I guess Time was celebrating its 75th anniversary, and I took the um, Man of the Year covers, mm. uh, one for each decade. Every 10 years, I, I drew out the, the thing. And 
for 50 years. Uh, they were all involved some way or other with our stance overseas. Really? And mm -hmm. suddenly they became Hollywood stars and yeah. television stars. Yeah. And um, that's why I guess I feel so differently than you. I feel this great sense of withdrawal. And when I read about the three Roosevelts, I think essentially of a dual focus on this country's problems and an understanding that we had to deal with the world outside. Well, I was trying to be polite to you as a prominent member of the media in talking about what's happened in the media, but I'll have to say that, uh, that the, uh, the degradation of the media, the commercialization of the media, we talked about this, of course, for years, indeed, for, cent for decades in this country, but it's just getting beyond anything I've known in earlier years. And um, I praise the media for dealing with foreign policy, but in terms of the commercialism of television and even radio, uh, it, it's just, I think, a tragedy. You know, media people, even news departments now, don't support uh, the kinds of um, uh, news gathering individuals mm -hmm. and offices overseas that, that we once had. We're not, as a people, interested in that. That's not quite as entertaining as what we uh, get mostly on television and in film. So why bother? And they're bothering less. They're saying they're not teachers. Anyway, Jim, I, I didn't mean to push you into a position <laughs> that uh, you don't want to be in. And I'm getting the signal <laughs> that, lo and behold, I've filibustered so that our time is up. But I do want to thank you so much for joining me again on The Open Mind. These are our first programs in this century. We're going to have to make sure we do many more before you and I aren't around. Thanks again for joining me. Thank you, Dick. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. If you would like a transcript of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Thomas and Teresa Malarkey Foundation, the Garfinkel Menard Foundation, the Center for Educational Outreach and Innovation at Teachers College, Columbia University, the Commonwealth Fund, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.